On the night of the 10th of November, 1941, two submarines stealthily left the harbour at Alexandria and headed for northern Libya. On board were 53 commandos and six special boat service operatives. Underway was one of the most audacious missions of the entire Second World War, a secret attempt to assassinate Hitler's top general, Erwin Rommel. If they succeeded, it could alter the course of the entire conflict. It takes a very special type of person to willingly go on a mission that you think might end your life. However, in just a few days, the operation would become a deadly game of cat and mouse, from which not all would return. Killing a high-ranking general would definitely mean torture and death if you were caught, and the Nazis would stop at nothing to exact revenge. This is the remarkable true story of three men who tried to drive a knife into the heart of Nazi Germany. They were the assassins of Alexandria. I'm Bruce Crompton, history fanatic, military antique collector and ex-paratrooper. In Amazing War Stories, you're going to hear about incredible actions, all taken from records housed in museum collections. It's only by unearthing these wonderful tales that I hope to keep these important institutions and the heroes contained within them alive for future generations. The door of a large Arabian house swung open and the silhouette of an impressive figure stepped out into the humid air. From his manner and the reaction of the people around him, it was clear to see he was a high-ranking officer. Saluting the two guards, the man casually descended the steps, the heels of his black leather boots crunching into the gravel as he slipped into his waiting car. Within a moment, it spun off in a cloud of dust and was heading down the driveway. Watching from afar was what appeared to be an aging Bedouin who was tending a market stall. The old Arab was in fact a young British Army officer, Captain John Hazeldon, who now thought he had all the proof he needed. The vehicle the man got into was General Rommel's staff car, and that meant only one thing. Hurrying back to his wireless set, he sent an encrypted message. He had identified Rommel and his headquarters in North Africa. That single message started a chain of events that would culminate in one of the most extraordinary missions of the entire Second World War. The British operation, codenamed Flipper, was a bold attempt to assassinate the infamous German general. If successful, Churchill thought it could deliver a decisive blow and possibly bring the conflict in Africa to an early close. The men who were to carry out this daring raid were the commandos. And this story is one of my favourites. I have many pieces of old military memorabilia in my house, but there is one item that is closest to my heart and has pride of place on my desk. It's my 1940s Fairburn Sykes fighting knife, generally known as a commando dagger. A gift my dad bought for me at a collector's fair. It's the type of weapon Hazelden would have had. It's simple in its design, a double-edged carbon steel blade with a foil grip. It was originally developed for the British commandos and its image is still used today as their arm badge. You can see it on our Amazing War Stories social media pages. These days, the only action my knife sees is cutting open envelopes, but I often wonder which commando once owned it and whether it was ever used in combat. The commandos were formed in the Second World War and were involved in some exceptionally bold and courageous missions. The one that sticks in my mind as probably the most audacious of them all was the operation to kill General Rommel, also known as the Desert Fox. It was an astonishing undertaking, one full of risk, and it's no surprise that a Victoria Cross was awarded 
to one of his participants, Lieutenant Colonel Keyes. You can see his medal at the Imperial War Museum in London. The Royal Marines don't have an official museum at the moment. They are trying to raise funds for one to be based in Portsmouth. There was another smaller public collection up in Scotland, but that has now sadly closed. Julie Miller is the curator at the Combined Military Services Museum in Essex and a PhD history student. She knows all about the challenges the Allies were facing in 1941. The war really was going very badly. Um, British forces, um, the, the Allies were really struggling against Germany. We were fighting on several fronts. Um, we'd suffered massive losses in North Africa and we really were up against it. Rommel, with the aid of Mussolini's army in Italy, had recently routed the British and the Allied forces had lost nearly half their tanks on the first offensive. That meant Egypt was of vital importance to us and it meant control of the Suez Canal as well as the oil fields and dominance in the southern Mediterranean. This also meant that Nazi military assets would have been tied up that could have been used elsewhere against us in Europe. In the Egyptian capital Cairo, two British officers stared at a map spread out over the desk in Allied headquarters. The heat was almost unbearable, but the men didn't mind. They had more exciting things to think about. Just how were they going to beat Rommel? As the men talked, a plan started to formulate. Lieutenant Colonel Geoffrey Keyes came up with an idea. Instead of trying to beat his forces, why not cut off the head of the snake? He would lead a small group of commandos on a dangerous mission behind enemy lines to kill or capture Rommel. So Operation Flipper was conceived. But the other man at the table, Lieutenant Colonel Laycock, had his doubts and was sceptical that such an operation would have any chance of success. Nevertheless, Laycock agreed to support Keyes. If his friend wished to play the hero, then so be it. And who knows, it might just work. When the proposal landed on Churchill's desk, Keyes was concerned that there was a chance it might not be sanctioned due to its desperate nature. However, the opposite was true. Churchill loved it. It was on. Winston Churchill sat behind his large mahogany desk, lit a cigar and opened the top secret folder containing details on Operation Flipper. He was always a man for making big plans and he imagined victory in North Africa to rival that of Waterloo. Rommel was one of Hitler's favourite generals, an inspired commander and a brilliant leader. If the British could get him before their next offensive, it would be a loss from which the Germans could struggle to recover from. The commandos were the special forces of the day and were ideally suited to such a hazardous mission behind enemy lines. Being part of this elite group meant a life full of danger. Therefore, the initial selection process was one of the toughest tests in the world at the time. Nick Cavill is a serving colonel in the Royal Marine Commandos. He has 20 years of experience of military operations in some of the harshest places on Earth, including the Arctic, jungle and desert. Well, commando training was and still is really tough. I think it's a way of testing whether or not people have both the physical and the mental attributes to conduct commando operations. For this particular mission, I think uh, out of 700 volunteers, only the first 500 who completed a 75 mile march across Scotland were accepted. The rest were sent back to their units. It was just as well the selection process was so arduous because the men of Operation Flipper would need to call upon all of their specialist physical and mental training. Keyes' plan was fairly straightforward. 
The men would board two submarines, the Tor Bay and the Talisman, and head towards the north coast of Libya, close to the Egyptian border. Once surfaced, the raiding parties, guided by SBS men in canoes, would paddle ashore in dinghies. Rowing quickly through the water, they were to land on the beach and meet their man on the ground, Captain Hazelden. Hazelden was the officer who had initially posed as a Bedouin and spent some weeks watching the Beda Latoria villa. It was he who had spotted Rommel's staff car, prompting the mission. Accompanied by an Arab guide, they then had to move quickly. One detachment would head towards the house to capture Rommel. One would destroy a communications mast at nearby Cyrene, and the final two would take out a couple of Italian Army Divisional HQs in the area. After the quick strike, they would then return to the landing zone, where Lieutenant Colonel Laycock would be waiting with the boats to take them back to the subs. It all sounded so simple, and to Keyes' mind, very achievable. And perhaps it might have been, if it wasn't for the fact that, unknown to them, a huge weather front had started to move in over the Mediterranean. Unfortunately, it would arrive exactly the same time and place they expected to land. Literally, a few weeks later, 37 men of 11 Commando boarded two submarines in Alexandria and slipped out of the harbour in the dead of night. This was a top secret mission and only a handful of people knew about it. They couldn't afford any breaches of security. Only whilst at sea, in the small, claustrophobic submarine, did Keyes feel safe enough to reveal to his men the true nature of their operation. Gathering his men in the torpedo room, he outlined to them what their individual responsibilities would be. He was to lead the most dangerous part of the mission, that of finding and capturing or killing Rommel. To assist him, he had earmarked two men, one of whom was more recently deskbound in divisional headquarters. Captain Robin Campbell was a personal friend of Keyes, but that wasn't the reason he was coming along. Importantly, this officer was a fluent German speaker and a language specialist. What the captain might have lacked in recent operational fitness, he more than made up for in bravery, as he had volunteered to come along when he heard a translator was needed. Sergeant Jack Terry was a very different type of man to Campbell. He was a tough, old-fashioned, non-commissioned officer. Broad, over six foot tall and a formidable figure, this former butcher's boy from Nottingham had found his calling in the army. He was just the kind of man you would want next to you in a fight. So taking out a high value target it is not as unusual today as it was then. You know, when you consider what was at Key's disposal, you realise just how brave he was. Uh, he had very few men, some submachine guns, grenades and a bit of explosives. You know, they were very much pioneers. If this mission were to happen today, it would be very different. We would have so much more in the way of intelligence and high-tech equipment. But it's important to remember it's less about the kit and more about the calibre of people that would carry out this kind of operation. Meanwhile, over in Libya, Rommel's staff car pulled up at a Luftwaffe-controlled aerodrome. The debonair general stepped out and quickly boarded a twin propeller plane. As the sun began to set, it took off. Its destination, Rome. The next day, Allied Command received the intelligence that Rommel had landed in Italy, but they had no idea how long he would be there for. Should they cancel the operation? What if Rommel's visit was brief and he returned after only a few days? Then they would miss a golden opportunity. The raid must continue as planned. An hour later, 
in the cover of near complete darkness, the two submarines, the Torbay and the Talisman, breached the choppy waters of the Mediterranean, and the men from 11 Commando readied themselves. The legend you're about to hear is taken entirely from eyewitness testimony and documents that were written shortly after the events. Everything is true, no matter how extraordinary it sounds. As men clambered down the conning tower, they encountered their first setback. Instead of the warm, gentle weather they'd expected to find at that time of the year, the wind was wild and the sea churned. They had surfaced in the middle of a storm. The men struggled to keep their feet on the slippery deck and preparing the Falbrook canoes and dinghies was incredibly hard on the heaving sub. One of the SBS kayaks smashed against the hull and was ruined. Keyes had deliberately chosen one of the darkest nights of the month to provide the submarine's cover whilst they sat on the surface of the sea. But frustratingly, this now played against him and his men as they struggled to get the mission underway. Meanwhile, the situation on the other submarine, Talisman, was even worse. It had become grounded, having been pushed onto a sandbank by the violent storm. One of the commandos had been thrown overboard and had drowned. He was the first casualty of the operation. Back on the tall bay, Keyes and his men finally lowered themselves into their canoes and made their way to the beach. Eventually, soaking and exhausted, they pulled the dinghies clear of the surf and waited for the rest of the raiders. But after an hour, the detachment from the other submarine was still nowhere to be seen. Because of the storm, communication was nearly impossible. So they had no way to find out what had happened to the rest of the party. Then out of the darkness, another dinghy crashed through the breakers onto the beach. On board was Laycock, but he only had seven commandos with him. Frustrating me for keys, out of the 59 he had planned for, they were now down to 34 men before the operation had even properly begun. I think Keyes did the right thing in adjusting his original plan due to the loss of so many of his troops. You know, he, he was probably thinking, you know, what, what, what else is going to go wrong? I mean, it could not have had a worse start. And I think even from that really early moment, he was probably just thinking, am I even going to be able to carry it out? A cold and wet Captain Hazelden greeted Keyes and Laycock and introduced them to their guide, a local Arab who would take them to their objectives. Keyes quickly decided that with so few men, only the Rommel and Wireless Station raids would go ahead. They would ditch the attacks on the two Italian headquarters. Briefing the men, he told them of their new objectives. As per the plan, Hazel then bid the team farewell, as Laycock hid the heavy canoes in a nearby cave and dug in to secure the beach for their return. Through the pouring rain, Laycock would have been able to see the remaining commandos head off into the darkness. I imagine he must have wondered how many of them he would see again. During the following day, the torrential rain continued. It was an 18 mile hike to their objective, which took the men over treacherous terrain. The march was grim, made even worse by the awful weather conditions. It was no surprise that their local guide soon gave up, unable to match the relentless pace of the commandos. Keyes had to make up the lost time. The attack had to happen in darkness. Eventually, as night fell, the raiders saw the shadowy outline of the villa ahead. Taking shelter in a cave, the men prepared for the attack. Captain Campbell, Keyes and Sergeant Terry were to enter the villa. There's no doubt in my mind, with only a fraction of his original force available, they understood that capturing the general now wasn't a viable option. 
However, Keyes realised that the second team should continue with their mission. Blowing up the communications mast at Cyrene would create a vital diversion, as well as causing an information blackout, which could help their escape. So he decided to press on with that part of the plan. He also allocated three soldiers to simultaneously destroy the nearby power plant, thus creating even more confusion. The rest were to be dispersed around the complex to prevent any interference to the operation from the enemy. The plan was set and the men cocked their weapons and stepped out of the cave. They were going to kill Rommel. The dark was intense and the suck and squelch of the mud sticking to their boots seemed to be amplified in the silence of the night. As the detachment neared the villa, Lieutenant Colonel Keyes posted the perimeter team, whilst Campbell and Terry readied their weapons. They moved forward and began the assault. Commando forces specialise in extreme environments, the Arctic, desert, jungle, and also in the urban environment. We call this sort of fighting modern urban combat. Crucial to success is good intelligence. Usually we would want to clear from the top down because it's unexpected and have the advantage of height. And you would use at least 30 men. So a troop's worth of people to try and clear a building like Rommel's headquarters. As they approached the villa, the three commandos encountered their next setback. The plan was to enter through the windows, but they were too high and barred shut. Something that Hazelden had failed to include in his intelligence report. The only option was to go in through the front entrance. Unbelievably, Keyes suddenly banged on the large doors whilst Campbell shouted in German, Open up! They heard the locks being pulled back and a guard peered around the heavy doors. Keyes with a drawn pistol instantly charged the German, but the guard grabbed the gun Keyes was holding and they fought face to face for their lives. The German was unarmed and was a bear of a man. Big and powerful, he was clearly stronger than Keyes. The two men struggled in a strange dance, each trying to get control of the pistol. Quick, Campbell, shoot him! Neither could reach for another weapon for fear of losing control. The German, realising the predicament, started shouting out for help. Something had to be done and quickly. The two men were positioned between two sets of doors, which made it impossible for Campbell or Sergeant Terry to get around keys and overpower the guard. Finally, Campbell saw an opportunity. He opened fire with his machine gun and killed the guard. But to his horror, he saw he'd also hit keys. Blood from a bullet wound in his shoulder started to seep through his tunic. Friendly fire does happen, and Keyes was able to carry on after having been shot, simply because of the adrenaline that was running through his system. Now, luckily, I haven't been shot, but I have seen it happen, and people can react really differently. And I think he probably just felt he was too busy to be shot, and carried on and did whatever he needed to to get the job done. Telling Campbell he was all right, Keyes rushed into the house. Annoyingly, the fight in the hallway meant they had lost the advantage. The commotion had alerted the whole villa. Sergeant Jack Terry looked up and saw the black polished boots of some German soldiers crashing down the internal stone steps, and he opened fire with a burst of his Tommy gun. Keeping the upstairs Germans at bay, the raiders then set about clearing the ground floor. There were two rooms to the left of the hallway and one to the right. Whilst Campbell cleared the room to the right, Keyes booted open the far door on the left and saw it was empty. Spinning round, he then noticed light spilling from underneath the first doorway. Quick, over here. He had assumed that no one would have been inside given the struggle that happened right outside it. Kicking it open, he 
saw a handful of German soldiers who had readied themselves for the assault. Keys opened fire with his Colt pistol and quickly closed the door again, holding it shut. The others rushed over. Was Rommel inside? Keys couldn't tell, but he thought he saw an officer. Campbell took out a grenade and pulled the pin and signalled to his boss to stand clear. Keys opened the door and accompanied by a burst from Terry's Tommy gun, Campbell threw in the grenade. As it sailed through the air, Keys jubilantly shouted, Well done! The grenade landed. Just before it exploded, one of the Germans got a shot off. A single bullet struck the British colonel in the chest and he slumped to the ground. After the explosion, dead and wounded enemy soldiers littered the floor. Sergeant Terry spotted a German officer trying to get out through the window, but he shot him before he could escape. Rushing into the room, he checked the bodies. Rommel wasn't there. In the hallway, Campbell saw his commander lying on the floor and quickly carried him outside. Keyes was dead. Shot just above the heart. The captain must have cursed their luck. Rommel was still nowhere in sight, and it was now looking increasingly unlikely that any of them would be able to get out alive. He rushed back towards the house to help his sergeant continue the search. But then another disaster. A bullet flew from out of the darkness and smashed into his shin, spinning him around from the impact. Campbell had unfortunately been shot by one of his own men, who thought he was a German entering the house. A few minutes later, Terry exited the villa. Rommel wasn't inside. He tried to help Campbell to his feet, but it was clear he couldn't make an escape. However, they still had unfinished business, and amazingly hadn't encountered any serious resistance yet. Now in command, Campbell ordered the men to blow up the electric plant. And any spare explosive they had left over, they were to throw into the house just to make sure. The charges, having been soaked in the rain, took some coaxing to work. But eventually they went off. The power plant was disabled and the villa was left smouldering. <laughs> Campbell then ordered the 15 men to set off towards the beach and the waiting submarine. He would await his fate with the Germans. As the men set off at a job, they heard a distant explosion. Clearly, the communications mast at Cyrene had been down. The enemy would definitely now be on full alert. The raiders needed to get out fast while they still had the cover of darkness. The next morning, the assassins arrived at the beach, but there was no sign of the detachment who had attacked the radio mast. Unfortunately, the combination of continuing bad weather mixed with more awful luck meant that they were unable to get back to the submarine. Laycock realised they had no option but to run for it. He ordered them to split up and try to make their own way back to friendly territory. It was every man for himself, and the only way they might be able to escape the hundreds of enemy soldiers now searching for them. The detachment that blew up the communications mast at Cyrene were cornered in a cave and had to surrender. Astonishingly, Lieutenant Colonel Laycock and Sergeant Terry both completed one of the most amazing efforts of escape innovation ever undertaken behind enemy lines. They survived in the desert for 37 days before being picked up by allies. A third, Bombardier John Brittlebank, also survived an amazing 40 days before being found by friendly forces. The raid was over, and despite the danger involved, astonishingly, only the commando on the submarine and Lieutenant Colonel Keyes died. 
It's missions such as this that really makes me proud to be a Royal Marine Commando. Keyes and his men didn't stop, continued and persevered. That's what makes a commando. And it's really important to remember that had Robble been there, they probably would have succeeded. We have a saying, once a Marine, always a Marine. And that's not just when you used to be in the Marines and you've now left. But for me, it stretches across the ages, really. The commandos of today stand on the shoulders of those giants. But I hope that people who are listening to this go to visit some of the museums to find out more about men such as Keyes and the incredible things they did. After the raid, Lieutenant Colonel Keyes was awarded the Victoria Cross, Britain's highest military honour. Rommel ordered the Keyes be buried with full military honours and instructed that photographs be taken of the ceremony and sent to his parents. A chivalrous act that increased the British respect for him. In recent times, some historians have argued that this raid wasn't worth the human cost and that the Allies should have called it off. Julie Smith feels the raid was a success. Well, I think hindsight is a wonderful thing, um, be, but you are also always viewing the past through a different lens. We really have to look at it as how it would have been regarded at the time. Um, and yes, the losses of, of men on this mission, including Keyes himself, of course, um, was tragic. Um, but the commandos were, you know, widely celebrated. Um, and the United States hadn't long joined the war um, and they welcomed this story to enthuse their populations. This encouraged people to sign up because they saw it as a very heroic endeavour. All three of our remaining heroes survived long past the end of the war. Lieutenant Colonel Laycock rose through the ranks to become a Major General, as well as the Chief of Combined Operations from 1943 to 1947. He was knighted and became Governor of Malta. Captain Robin Campbell was taken prisoner, but was repatriated in 1943 because of his wounds. He lived to the ripe old age of 73. Sergeant Jack Terry was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal for his role in the raid that night. He later served with the Special Air Service. Post-war, he joined the Nottingham Police until his retirement 28 years later. Whenever I look at my commando dagger, I'm often reminded of this raid and the important symbolism it represents to the Royal Marines today. It is incredible to think how a single item that was given to me by my father led me to find out more about our history's forgotten heroes. I really want to help museums, both big and small, in these difficult times. They've taken a financial battering and I'm worried that if we're not careful, the important stories they hold will become locked away from the public forever. Please take the time to give this podcast a like or a review as it helps it to be found by other listeners or even subscribe. It's free. One final thing, a word of thanks to the people, museums and organisations who free of charge gave up their time to help me tell this story. This episode of Amazing War Stories was written and researched by Charlie Phillips. It was executive produced and directed by Ed Sayer. The associate producer is Lois Crompton. Editing was by Tony Simmons. 3D mastering and sound design is by the Vaudeville Sound Group. And the music is composed by Extreme Music. Music.